Good morning, Harvest Point. We're so glad you're here with us. If you would, please stand and worship with us. was me before you spoke it to me. You were the king of kings. Yes, you were. Yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still. You broke above all these angels and saints cry out. We join them as we stand. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Yeah. The God you gave me went so I could praise the Matchless thing, all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offer, a light that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. is 
everybody. Uh, welcome to Harvest Park. We're so glad that you are here in worship this morning. Um, it's good to see uh, good to see so many of you. Uh, sorry, we'll get my mic adjusted. It's a little feedback you hear. Uh, I'm Jonathan, the pastor here. Just want to let you know about some things coming up in our life together. First, if you're, if you're new here, you're newish here, we would love to connect with you. In the seat back in front of you, there's a little Get Connected card. You can, you can fill that out. Put it in the offering box on your way out of the service today, and we'll reach out to you and let you know more about what's going on here. I um, also want to let you all know our leadership team is meeting right after church today, and we'll be uh, planning for the future, updating our COVID protocols. So look out in your email this week for an update. And if you don't receive the weekly emails from the church, you can also just write that on the card, and we will get you added to our email list. So um, that's coming up uh, today at 4 o'clock p.m., there's a women's gathering here at the church. Women of all generations are invited to gather together uh, to connect relationally and to grow spiritually with one another. So today at 4 o'clock. And I also wanted to let you know that next weekend, uh, it's a fifth Sunday, it's Memorial Day. Um, we are going to have all generations worshiping in here together as well. So we're going we're gonna to let our, our children's ministry volunteers have a week off. We like to, to bring everybody together every once in a while to worship and to praise God and to pray together. So that's going to be next Sunday. And then on June 6th, for families of children and students, we're having a cookout after worship um, for us as families to just come together to connect with one another, 
get to know one another and, and have some food and some fun. So that's coming up June 6th. And then also want to let you know, uh, today is the last day to let Jason Brown, our student pastor, know if you are interested in going to summer camp with our student ministry. And so to give you a little taste of what that's going to be like, we have a video here uh, to show you what it's going to be like this July. No, no, just me. I'm, I'm too old for all the dances. It makes you want to dance just a little bit, uh, but we don't want anybody to go to the hospital here today. So um, I want to invite Jason Brown's going to come up, um, and I want to let you know uh, we, we're not passing the offering plates in this season, but you can support our mission ministries online or through the offering boxes on your way out or through text to give. Uh, but this morning we are are celebrating our graduates among us, and so yeah, give the graduates a round before they even get up here. Um, we, we know it has been a long year. It has been a long year for students in and out. Oh man, just craziness. And so, um, we want to celebrate, um, and we know there are some people here who may not have submitted information, but we're going to invite you up in just a minute. But as we read names and where they're graduating from, what they're graduating from, um, as your name is read, if you'd be willing to come up on stage, we'll, we'll just invite you to come up at that point and then we'll pray for you in just a minute. So first up, Becca Smith. Graduating, Woo. Uh, Maryville University, master's degree, pediatric nurse practitioner in the house. Now everybody's going to come for medical advice. Everybody's coming for medical advice. Then we have Finley Stanfield, Bethlehem Elementary, kindergarten graduation. Come on up. Ready to take on the world. Uh, then we have Alex Villanueva, graduated from high school from Elka, Eagles Landing Christian Academy. Come on up. And then we have um, Sherilyn Warren. She's graduating from Brunel with a bachelor's in science. I don't think she's with us today. We got Caleb Smith from Tessa Hall Elementary. And we got Carson Smith from Tessa Hall Elementary. And then I think we have the cutest photo. We have Bianca Chudzik graduating from Eagles Landing Learning Center. Yes. Brenna Moat from Union Grove High School. Woo! I was going to say go Wildcats. I don't even, what, what is y'all's mascot? Wolverine. That's close. That's close. Wolverines. Uh, then we got Austin Umstead graduating from Faith Academy High School. Come on up. And um, we have other pre-K, fifth grade graduates in our children's ministry who are being celebrated today. But if there's anybody else in here that is graduating pre-K, kindergarten, whatever, this year, college, graduate school, come on up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on up. All right. All right. We've got Hayden graduating fifth grade. Man, man, oh man, awesome, awesome, awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, yes. Graduating what, eighth grade? Seventh grade? Come on up, come on up. So, you know, every year we give the graduates a gift, and I was thinking, reflecting on, on what to give them. Usually we give them a book, and then somebody wise said, Jonathan, they're not going to read any book you give them. And that rang true. So instead, we have a gift card to Scoop's Ice Cream at McDonald's. So you can just eat, eat some ice cream. Uh, so here you go, everybody. 
Um, go get yourself. This is enough for like two. So invite somebody to join you and uh, have fun at, at Scoops there. And um, now Jason Brown, our, our student pastor, is going to pray over our graduates. But if you would, would you reach out a hand and just extend them as, as your sign of, of agreeing with Jason and we'll let them pray over us. Sorry, no, we need, we need the mic. All right. Hello? There we go. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these students. Um, whatever stage in life they are transitioning from and transitioning to, just be with them in this transition. Um, it's a whole new world for them. Um, Lord, just uh, in those dark times, let your word be a light into their path. Um, just be with them. Give them courage. Give them strength. And congregation... Give the congregation the wisdom that when they are to celebrate the victories with them, but also be there for the failures. Lord, be with them throughout their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank y'all so much. Y'all can have a seat. Appreciate y'all. Parents, it's a $10 gift card, so it's not all for them. They're, they're supposed to treat whoever drives them if they can't drive themselves. Um and, uh, and now as we continue in worship, um, we're going we're gonna to invite you in, in just a moment to sing with us a song we've introduced a few times now. It's called The Blessing, and it is, it is a blessing um, over these graduates, and so we want to sing it over them together. So um, I invite you to, to stand and sing with us.
Y'all give our worship team and the graduates another round of applause. Whenever we sing that song, I always uh, think back to my, my, my childhood church because some of you know that song is based upon uh, a blessing that God tells Moses to give over the Israelites. From Numbers uh, chapter 6, we got it here. Here's what we read in God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So this is the, the blessing Moses gave. And growing up in my home church, uh, I loved this song when I first heard it in this passage. Because every week in our church, our, our pastor, he wore a big black flowing preaching robe. Y'all know what I'm saying? Anybody grow up in a church where the pastor wore the big preaching robe? Had a big old gold cross. Y'all think I don't have that stuff, but I do. I have it in my closet, and I'll pull it out one day on you, okay? But so, so he, he, you know, he had his, his full regalia on, and every week as we left church, he would speak this blessing over us as the benediction. But he would add something a little bit extra at the end. He would say, may the Lord give you peace. He added on the Apostle Paul's words, perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. And so every week we would receive that blessing, and then we would go out into the world. And then later in the week, when Sunday came along, we would gather together once again. We would worship. We would receive that blessing, and we would be sent out. I mean, this is kind of the rhythm of the Christian life, gathering together and then being sent out into the world on mission, empowered by the Holy Spirit. But, but as a young person, kind of middle school, high school, graduation around that time, I began to notice something, and that was that, that many of my friends who I went to vacation Bible school with, graduated with, went on mission trips with, all this kind of stuff— I noticed that they would go out after the benediction, but then a lot of them kind of didn't really come back in. Might see them Christmas, Easter, or on a college break, but, but then I began to notice that a number of my friends had, had kind of left church forever, people who had grown up in church. And if you grew up in church, I mean, you probably noticed the same phenomenon, right? I mean, maybe you, you had friends and like, maybe it was you. Like in high school, you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm done with my parents' religion. I'm going to do my own thing. Or in college, you know, you said, I'm going to kind of party a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to explore the world. And, and so maybe you, you saw that in your experience. People who grew up in church left the church. But for generations really above mine, what the trend was, was a lot of times when people had kids, you know what would happen? They would kind of come back to church, right? They'd, they'd come back to church with the next generation and... Everybody would continue to grow and pass on the faith. But, but, but in case you haven't noticed or realized, things in our culture have shifted. And now there's really a generation or generations who are growing up in the church. And then really as soon 
is they have the chance not to come back. They're, they're choosing to say, no, I'm not, I'm not coming back. The latest estimates are, are 40 to 50 percent of, of, of youth who grow up in church, as soon as they're able to not come back, that they don't. And, and I mean, you can you can see some statistics here. We'll, we'll put up a chart. This is a little complicated, so I'll just walk you through it. This is 2018, 2019. The top is the percentage of people who identify as a Christian in the U.S. And so the silent generation, 1928 to 1945, if you were born in those years, 84% of that generation identify as Christians. And then baby boomers, 76%, Generation X, 67%, only 49% of millennials even identify as a Christian. And this chart doesn't even touch on, on Gen Z and the other generations. And then if you look at attendance of religious services, 50% of, of the oldest generation say they attend worship monthly or more. And then you see the chart going down on the left side, only 22% of millennials now attending worship monthly or more. And, and, and the trends are moving in this same direction. And here's the thing, you don't need a chart to know this, right? I mean, you can look at your own family members, you can look at your own friends and, and feel that things are shifting in our culture. And so what's interesting is if you begin to ask people, hey, like, why, why, why have you left church? You know, like you grew up in it, I thought you had a good experience or whatever. You begin to ask people, you'll find a variety of different answers. But if you kind of look at, at, the, at the data and talk to different people, you'll find that kind of a common theme of why people are ultimately walking away from the church is that along the way they felt like continually they were told no. No, no, you, you can't read that book. You can't watch that movie. You can't play that video game. No, you can't ask those questions. We're not going to talk about race, mental health, school shooting, sexuality. No, there's topics off limits. No, that question about the Bible, we don't want you asking. No, we don't want to hear it. No, we don't care what you think. We want you to know what we think. No, one day you can leave, but you're not mature enough right now. No, no, no. Like th That's what a, a generation has felt like they've heard. And so a lot of them, as soon as they get the chance to say yes or no to the church, they're saying no as well. And they're leaving. So this morning I want to talk with you about this, this challenge, not, not just for our church, but, but for the church in America. Not just for kids who grew up in church, but now there's a generation who, who, who haven't ever experienced church or a worship service or know nothing about the Bible at all. So I want to talk to you this morning about what I think we're called to do, what we're called by Jesus to do, how we're called to respond to this dilemma. But but I also want to let you know as we explore kind of the solution that this dilemma really isn't anything new. That while, while the trends may look different or the trends may look unique, people who are followers of Jesus have been saying no to the next generation for generations now. And, and this morning we're going to look – and a scripture passage in Mark chapter 10. And so if you have your Bibles, I, I invite you to open them there or, or a phone. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have some at the Welcome Center. We'd love to, to have you take one on the way out this morning. But in Mark chapter 10, we, we find a very plain account of when some members of the next generation come to encounter Jesus and, and the disciples, the earliest followers of Jesus Christ, their response to these young people. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 13, Jesus has just traveled to Judea. Crowds are pressing in on him. All sorts of people are wanting to, to hear him, to listen to him, to get touched by him. And we read this in verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. I'm going to read that again. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuke them. So, so what's happening here is people have heard Jesus is the Messiah, that he can heal diseases, that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life that they've heard. And they're, they're coming from all over to see him, to encounter him. And so these parents, these grandparents, these people in the community are bringing the young people. They're bringing the next generation to Jesus so that he can lay hands on them and bless them. And, and this would have made sense because, I mean, Jesus, when he was little, he was blessed in the temple. And so now people are bringing their children to be blessed by Jesus, this rabbi. But it wasn't just a spiritual thing. It's also practical. Because a lot of researchers estimate 
that 30% of children in this era died as infants. 30% infant mortality rate, it's estimated. Another 30% would die by the age of six from war, from famine, from all sorts of stuff. And, and so parents practically are saying, like, look, we want our children to be blessed by this miracle worker. And the disciples, you, you see what happens. They just say no. They say no. And we don't exactly know why they say no, but we can guess why they say no. I mean, they're, they're like, look, Jesus is busy. Jesus needs to be with the tax collectors. He needs to be with the rich young ruler. He needs to preach about the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't have time for little kids with snotty noses who are running around touching everybody, getting everybody sick. They're like, no, no get out of here. Pushing them away, right? They're like crowding us up. Pushing them back. And, and this kind of sounds harsh to us that the disciples would rebuke these kids coming to see Jesus. But in their culture, it made sense because in their culture, children were not valued at all. They were seen as having little to no intrinsic value or worth. Their really worth was what they could do for the family or how they could provide for the family. And so when they were older, they were valued a little bit more. But when they were younger, it was like, what's the need for these kids? That's how their society treated children in their day. And so it made sense for the disciples. They're just like, no, get away from Jesus. He needs to focus on people who actually matter the most. Not you, the next generation. But Jesus didn't agree with them. Verse 14, we see this. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. When Jesus saw this, he was and dignity. When he saw the people saying no, some translations, yours might say displeased. Others say he was angry. A lot of times we don't think of angry Jesus. But he's angry sometimes. And here he has a righteous anger directed at his misguided disciples. And he explains to them why. He says to them, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he placed his hands on them. And he blessed them. You might have seen like a picture of that before, right? The, the beautiful picture of Jesus with all the children crowded on him and just the love in that moment. I mean, it's a beautiful picture of, of Jesus saying yes when the disciples had been saying no. And so here Jesus, he, he's saying yes. Yes to the children. Come to me. I, I, I want you. I want an encounter with you. I want to bless you. He's saying yes to the next generation. I love you. Yes, the kingdom of God belongs not just to the adults and to the people who think they're spiritually mature. The kingdom of God belongs to to you. Yes, you don't have to have a lot of accomplishments or, or some kind of resume. Yes, you matter to God here and now. Yes, you have value. Yes, you have worth. Yes to the next generation. That's what Jesus is saying in this moment. And actually later, the disciples do this again, right? They have another encounter with kids and they're misguided and they're thinking and they're kind of telling them no. And Jesus, he actually ups the ante even more. Luke chapter 9, verses 48, he says this. He says, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. And so Jesus says, when you welcome a little child, when you welcome the next generation, when you say yes to them, he said, you're actually welcoming me. And when you welcome me, you're welcoming my heavenly father. Who sent me? So when it comes to this this challenge of, of what what are we supposed to do with with young people who are walking away from the faith or young people who know nothing about the faith, I, I think Jesus here, I mean, he kind of makes it pretty simple. He, I think, he's telling us as a church we need to say yes to the next generation. And when I, when I say that, I'm not I'm not saying we should never say no and say, no, that's wrong. No, that's harmful. No, that's not good for your body, mind, or soul. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I think Jesus is calling us to say like he did to them, yes, you have value. Yes, you have 
worth. Yes, the kingdom belongs to you. Yes, we love you because Jesus loves you as well. Now, some of you right now, if you're not a parent or you're in high school or middle school, you're thinking, okay, check out. This doesn't apply to me. But if you notice, Jesus says, whoever, whoever welcomes children welcomes me. So he's not just speaking to grandparents, to parents, not just speaking to the older generations. He's saying to all of us, whoever welcomes the children, the next generation welcomes me. And so we all have a part to play as the body of Christ in this role of passing on our faith to the next generation. And David in the Psalms, Psalm 145, he says it this way. He says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. And I love that line. One generation shall commend your works to another. This is our calling as a church to say yes to the next generation. And you might be thinking like, well, okay, well, practically, what does that look like? And I've been thinking this week, okay, practically, what does that mean for us as Harvest Point to say yes to the next generation? And I've been thinking about the membership vows that any members who join Harvest Point, United Methodist Church, or any actually United Methodist Church around the world, millions of people have said they have committed to serve the church and the community with these five things, with their prayers, their presence, their gifts, their service, and their witness. And I I think these are a great place to start. And actually, even if you're not a member of of this church, of any church, even if you're not sure what you believe or you're, you're new here today, I think these are five things we can all do to invest in the next generation and to say yes to them and to help them have a faith that lasts a lifetime. And so when it, when it comes to this, I'll just walk through them briefly. Man. When it comes to prayers, I think we can say yes to the next generation by simply praying for them. By praying for them. I, mean, I want you to think about what the students and children have been through this last year. I mean, it's been hard for a lot of us. But for their generation, it has been extremely, extremely difficult. And you know the things that are battling for their their minds, their, their attention, for their identities. You, you know all of those things. And I think we as a church need to battle for them in prayer. We need to intercede for them in prayer. And so my challenge for you is in your, in your prayers, in your daily prayers, add the children and the students of Harvest Point to your prayer list. Add them to your prayer list. Begin praying for them, interceding for them. If you don't know the names of any children in our church, I'd encourage you on the way out today, if you if you see a parent, ask them. Say, hey, I, I don't know you. I'm so-and-so. I don't know your kid, but could I pray for your kid? And ask for their first name. Begin praying for them. This matters. And at the end of our, our service, I'm going to invite anybody who, who's – just willing and able, if you'd like to come pray down front here for the next generation, I'm going to invite you to do that. So I think it starts with, with prayer, but then it, it, it continues by saying yes with our presence. And here I'll start by directly speaking to the parents. Parents, all the research of the last few decades points to the same thing. That if you want your children to have faith in Jesus Christ, then you need to be serious about your faith in Jesus Christ. It is the one of the most highly correlated things. The greatest impact you can have on your child's faith is to make your presence a priority in worship and Christian community, to, to make your faith serious throughout the week by praying and having conversations. And so your presence matters. And so I would encourage you to take that seriously because you have the single greatest impact on your child's faith far and above any other factor. That's the first thing. It's, it's tempting to outsource it, but it can't be outsourced. The second thing is, is for the church, one of the other leading factors that points towards students who come back to church once they graduate high school 
is the number of relationships they have with non-parental figures in their church. And so I would encourage you, get to know people. Get to know the students. Get to know the kids. Don't, don't just wave. Ask them their name. Greet them. Invite them to be a part of what you're doing. Invest in their lives because this makes a huge difference. Because when they, when, when they graduate and the only people they knew were their parents, well, it's kind of hard and awkward to come back. But when they have a community that they know loves them, a community that is present with them, that is for them, as we sang in the song, it makes a difference. So our presence and their lives matters. And there's, there's gifts. And here I'll speak directly to financial gifts. Your financial gifts matter. And I'm so grateful for your financial generosity because it enables us as a church to to hire a student pastor like Jason Brown, to have a children's pastor like Tammy Miller, who's back there with the children right now. It enables us to have age-appropriate environments for them, children's ministry, student ministry, to have curriculum and to, to impact their lives in many different tangible ways. You're, you're giving to the general fund. It matters. It makes an impact on them. But specifically this morning, I'll, I'll point to one thing. That, that we're looking for in, in the future. And that is as the students go to camp, one of the things, one of the ways you can practically say yes to them is to give above and beyond your regular giving to the student ministry camp fund to help students who would otherwise not be able to go to camp, go to camp. Every year we, we try to subsidize their costs. We try to offer scholarships. And so after service, there's a table in the lobby. Jason and some students will be there. If you're interested in supporting the student ministry, you can give a gift specifically to them to help them as they go to camp this summer. And so they have information on how you can do that. And you can just write student ministry on a check or online, but they'll let you know out there and you can meet some of the folks you'd be supporting. But your giving matters. And a couple years ago, we had a student come back from camp and she told one of her leaders, she said, you know, I never, I never experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, or really knew anything about the Holy Spirit until I went to camp. And camp for her made all the difference. That's an investment. That's a return on investment you, you can't find anywhere else. Her life was transformed. And your giving helps enable the transformation of lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. So your gifts matter. It's a way you can say yes. But then God also gives us spiritual gifts. All of us uniquely in the body of Christ. And so we can also say yes through serving out of our spiritual gifts. And the specific thing we're asking for in this season is, is help with our children's ministry. Serving the next generation of infants like my son. Children who are in preschool. Children who are older. A way you can say yes to them is say yes to serving in an arena like our children's ministry. And I know when, when a lot of you hear that, like it's very intimidating. You say, you know, I don't know anything about children these days. I don't know that much about the Bible. I don't know that I have the energy or the stamina. I, I don't know if I have the right scheduling to do all of this. And I know there's a lot of unknowns, but I do know this, that when you step out and serve, you will be a blessing to the next generation. And you will be blessed as you serve. As you seek to make an impact on the next generation, you will be impacted. And so outside, after the service, we have a display. It says, say yes to the next generation. It's all of the different ways we have serve opportunities in our children's ministry. We have opportunities working directly with little kids, working not directly with children at all, like at our security desk, signing people in, ways that are with our parents, once a month opportunities, irregular opportunities, we have opportunities for you to serve, to say yes to the next generation by using your spiritual gifts. And I talked to Tammy this morning, and she gave me a couple of the, the most pressing needs. On the first Sunday of the month, somebody to check people in and run the security desk. And on the third and fourth Sundays of the month, you could just commit to one of those, is being back in a large group setting with our children, with her and other key volunteers, supporting them. That is a very practical way you can say yes and invest in the lives of children at Harvest Point and in our community. So after service, she'll be out there. But then the, the, the last one is this. It's our witness. 
It's our witness. And I'll tell you this. I'm not, y'all think I'm a member of the next generation. I'm not, okay? It's like younger than me, but. <laughs> One of the things the next generation is looking for the most is an authentic faith. A real faith, a faith that makes a difference, not just for one hour on Sunday, but every single day of the week. They can smell fake a mile away, and they're not interested in it. They want people who walk with Jesus every day. They want people who, when they mess up, they apologize, and that's what we're called to do. They want people who are stepping out with obedience, following Jesus. They want people with Courage. They're looking, I read this this week and I thought this was so profound. It said they're not looking for incredible people in the church. They're looking for credible people. They're looking for people with integrity, people who take their faith seriously, people who don't say one thing and then just do the opposite all the time. And so this is our calling. A way we can say yes to the next generation is to be witnesses to Jesus Christ to them, to model a life empowered by the Holy Spirit to the next generation. So these are some of the ways I think we as a church are called to say yes. But it moves it moves far beyond these ways, right? Saying yes to the next generation also means saying yes to getting Kool-Aid on your Sunday best when you're serving in children's ministry. It might mean saying yes to like learning the latest TikTok dances, you know, I don't know them. I don't know them. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not. I'm not young enough. Okay. <laughs> saying yes, it means it might mean staying up late at a lock-in with our student ministry, and then being so tired the next day, or or planning every Sunday to have an afternoon nap because the little kids in the nursery wore you out. I mean, saying yes looks like and means a lot of different things. But I can tell you this: in all the different ways you say yes, they matter. They make a difference because when you say yes to the next generation. You're helping someone else say yes to Jesus Christ. You're helping someone else. And I know that's true because that's my story. When I was a sixth grader, I didn't put a photo up because I didn't want y'all to see me. It's embarrassing. I've shown it before, but I was a sixth grader. I had, I had my gelled hair. I had like my old Navy matching outfit every week. I was so self-conscious. I was so fearful. I didn't know what was going on in the world. But there was a group of people in my church. Who said yes to me. They helped me move from fear to love, from self-consciousness to Christ-centeredness. They helped me follow Jesus. And they were just volunteers. They were just people who said yes. Matt, Chip, Don, and Bubba were the key four. Matt, he had grown up in our church, gone to college, dropped out came home and I just thought he was the coolest and there was Chip Chip was in high school because you're never too young to serve the next generation Chip was in high school serving us as middle schoolers and he had a jacked up truck with mud tires do people still do that is that still a thing he had a jacked up truck with mud tires and he always had three people wanting to be his girlfriend okay he was a cool dude linebacker Rockdale County High School and he, he served us there was Don. He had been in the military. Left the military. Divorced, but he loved students. He just loved students. So after his divorce, he had a lot more free time. And he, he said, I want to invest in y'all. There was Bubba. Bubba, I talked to Bubba a lot. He was, uh, he graduated high school. God had called him into ministry. But he kept saying no. But he said, yeah, I'll teach a middle school boy Sunday school class. He didn't know what he was getting into. We were mean and terrible to him, okay? I hope that's not your experience here. We were, we were mean. We made fun of him. He was so patient and loving with us. But in middle school, I felt called to ministry. And his presence in my life helped me say yes to God. And then he said yes, and he serves as a pastor now. It's emotional for me because I know the difference these people made. And they weren't 
they weren't superheroes probably in anybody else's eye except for mine. Because they had the love of Jesus in them. And they said, we want to share that love with whoever. And they shared it with me. A middle schooler. They helped me say yes to God. Say yes to my call to ministry. They helped me grow in prayer, grow in knowledge of the scriptures. And I am forever grateful. So your yes matters. Your yes might just help someone in the next generation say yes to their next step of faith with Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we close our, our, our final song, I want to invite you, if you're willing to intercede for the next generation, to come forward to pray for them. And then after church, talk with Jason in the lobby about our students in camp. Talk with Tammy about our children's ministry. I want to invite you to say yes. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are... We are grateful for your faithfulness in our lives. We are grateful that no matter what age we first came to a realization of you and your love for us, that at every age, you were there ready to embrace us. God, for people who came to faith as little children in this room, we give you thanks for their churches and for the volunteers who served them for their parents and grandparents who prayed for them. God, for people who began to know you in student ministry, we give you thanks for the student pastors who so often remain nameless, who think maybe they never made an impact, but they did. God, we give you thanks for the ministry you're doing in this church and that you've been doing now for some 20-odd years. God, we thank you for the generation that's been raised up. We pray for this generation of, of children and students now, God, that you would overwhelm their hearts with your love and your grace and your mercy. And God, we thank you that, that you invite us to be a small part of that. That, God, you could do all of this on your own, but you choose to use broken vessels like everyone in this room. And so, God, as we reflect on your grace and your goodness to us, we pray that you would speak to us. You would help us to see how you're calling us to say yes today. So that others might say yes and take their next step with you. We ask all of this in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So I invite you any time during this closing song, if you're willing to intercede for the next generation, would you come and pray? Or you can pray in the comfort of your own seat. I invite you to stand and worship with us.
shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace, perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. Go in peace. Uh, Tammy and Jason will be in the lobby. We love you. God loves you too. Amen.